As the managing editor of the Journal of the European Economic Association, I would like to welcome you all to the 14th GEAR FBBVA lecture. This series of lectures is made possible by the generosity of the Fundacion BBVA, and we are extremely grateful for this continued support. The series has now become a noted entry in the academic calendar of keynote lectures. Each year, the lecture is first delivered in January at the ASSA meetings, and now in May, the lecture is delivered here at the FBBVA headquarters in Madrid. The lecture is subsequently published as a lead article in an issue of GIA in the following year. Let me just start by saying a few words about the journal. GIA was established in 2003 with the goal of becoming a top-tier general interest journal in economics, publishing the very best work across all subfields of economics in macro, in applied microeconomics, theory and applied microeconometrics. GIA is well on the way of achieving its goal. Its two and five year impact factors are in line with other leading top five general interest journals in economics and turnaround times for first submissions are well within three months and submissions across all fields and from all parts of the world are increasing. I'm proud to be leading a great editorial team at the journal, ably assisted by an editorial board made up of the very best economists from around the world. Let me take this opportunity to remind all uh, researchers in the audience of what a great outlet is, uh, a GIA is for your best work. Consistent with GIA appealing to a general interest audience, the lectures are given, are given in all fields of economics by world leading scholars. The inaugural FBBVA lecture in the series was in 2005. That was given by Jean Tirol, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in 2014. Today's speaker is Orazio Atanasio, the Jeremy Bentham Research Professor of Economics at University College London, Research Director at the Institute for Fiscal Studies, and Co-Director of the Center for the Evaluation of Development Policies at the Institute for Fiscal Studies. He is a Fellow of the Econometric Society and the British Academy, a former President of the European Economic Association, and the President-elect of the Econometric Society. He's been an editor at the Review of Economic Studies, Quantitative Economics, and at GIA, and has been awarded numerous prizes over his career. Arazio obtained his PhD from the London School of Economics in 1988. Since then, he has published close to 100 academic articles, including multiple papers in GIA, that have been cited more than 18,000 times. His work has been highly influential in both macroeconomics and microeconomics, covering core topics such as consumption, savings, labor supply, housing, the accumulation of human capital, risk sharing, and the development of measurement tools. On a personal note, let me say that uh, Arazio and I have been colleagues at UCL and IFS for close to 14 years. Over that time, he's been a constant source of inspiration, good advice, and friendship. I'm delighted to be able to introduce Arazio's FBBVA lecture today, um, the title of which is Consumption Insurance in Networks with Asymmetric Information. Arazio, the floor is yours for the next 60 minutes. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, uh, thanks Imran for the very nice words and uh, thank to BBVA for the hospitality. I had a very nice day today in Madrid, uh, first this morning here and this afternoon at SEMFI. Uh, I haven't been back in Madrid for a long time, it's, it's nice to, to be f with friends and see everybody again. So today's uh, talk, uh, as Imran was saying, is a consumption insurance in networks uh, with asymmetric information. It's co-authored with uh, Sonia Kutrikova, who is here in, in the audience. So I refer to her for all the difficult questions. Um, this is the outline of my talk. Uh, we'll have a little bit of theory at the beginning, not, not a huge amount, but some. And then I will move on to analyze some uh, pretty novel data from, from Tanzania. And uh, this is the pointer. Uh, and then uh, I will talk about uh, the work we do 
on how to measure in this data asymmetric information and then move on to uh, uh, talk back to the theory of uh, resharing and how the two can be related both in theory and uh, empirically. So uh, the starting point, the motivation of this work is that life in uh, developing countries can be uh, hard and can be very risky because the resources available to people can vary a lot over time. And, uh, and if you start from a, a, a pretty low level, close to subsistence, and you receive a, a negative shock, then, then you can be in, in really dry straits. Um, so these shocks happen with some frequency, especially in, uh, uh, in um, uh, uh, rural uh, contexts. Many of these shocks are idiosyncratic. When I started many years ago to work, uh, think about these problems, um, I was saying, okay, in agriculture, in the developing countries, weather is a big deal. Um, and weather shocks, if it rains, it rains everywhere. And that's quite misleading. Um, I remember at the time Rob Townsend was, uh, was pointing out to me that even if it rains everywhere in a village, the effect of that, or, or there is a lack of rain in a village, the effect of that particular uh, shock can be diff very different for different households depending on the soil that they have, the, uh, the crops that they planted. So there's lots of idiosyncrasies in the production and in income. And therefore, uh, given this uh, idiosyncr idiosyncratic nature of the, of the shocks, um, insurance can be quite important and can, it can be very valuable for, for some of these information. Now, having said that, formal insurance markets do not very rarely exist in, in this context. Why? Well, there are lots of imperfections and frictions that prevent the, the, the presence of these uh, formal markets, like imperfect information, like the difficulty of enforcing a certain set of co uh, contracts. And therefore, in the, uh, uh, given that these formal markets are missing informal insurance, in these village economies can be important and as a consequence have received quite a bit of attention. So informal insurance is based on uh, individual transfers and uh, the role of these um, transactions can be very important a, in providing insurance, providing something that is valuable for these people. The other dimension that is sometimes uh, ignored is that the presence of these uh, very important markets can uh, conflict with the provision, of, say, by governments uh, or by uh, uh, international institutions of other forms of insurance. In the sense that, for instance, uh, if the government provides with insurance, can interfere with the functioning of those markets. Therefore, it's important to understand how this market works and, 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 and in particular, the role that different frictions can play in the operation of these markets. For instance, there is, a, there is a quite a bit of work on this. For instance, uh, uh, um, Kevin Mushin and uh, Mark Rosenzweig has pointed out that the, the, the uh, caste in England, in India, play a very important role in providing insurance, but at the same time might pose some um, obstacles to mobility. You don't want to leave your village because you might lose connection with the castes and with the members that, uh, that provide you with insurance. Uh, as a matter of fact, in, in some recent experiments where um, people provide uh, institutions, big institutions provided uh, insurance against uh, weather shocks, aggregate insurance, the pickup uh, rate of these products was extremely low. And some people found it quite, quite um, puzzling. 
Therefore, we need, we need to understand what's going on, and, and, and to understand these things, you need uh, some theory. Now, a benchmark model of uh, which can be very useful is uh, starting with the assumption that insurance is perfect. So suppose that uh, people have uh, a perfect way to uh, diversify away idiosyncratic shock. This is a, is a line of research that was promoted many years ago by Rob Townsend. Now, obviously, that line of research requires some very uh, strong assumptions. In particular, you require perfect information so that you can write contracts on observable um, shocks. And requires uh, the possibility of enforcing those contracts. <clears throat> those are very strong assumptions, sometimes uh, unrealistic. However, this structure can provide very strong testable implication for the data about um, the allocation of resources within, within, the, within such an economy. What is very interesting of this approach, and is something that we'll be using in the work that we'll, uh, I'll be presenting today, is the fact that you can derive uh, um, implications without being very specific or without needing much information about the ways in which those allocations are achieved, about the uh, presence of transfers or other ways to, um, to, to achieve those allocations. And, and so you can, you can um, um, derive these implications that basically reflect the essence of what insurance means, it means that the idiosyncratic shocks are diversified away and they are not reflected into the, into the distribution of consumption uh, in, in that economy. And, and, and therefore that could be, even in the presence of in, imperfections, they can constitute a useful benchmark against which to, uh, to see this. Now, as a matter of fact, the hypothesis of uh, perfect insurance is uh, by and large rejected empirically. And this probably suggests that some of these imperfections in, uh, in these economies are uh, important. So the, the assumptions that are making uh, behind these models are too strong. However, it's also clear that while perfect insurance doesn't happen, uh, there is some smoothing that goes on. Some insurance is provided somehow. Um, and, and that's true not just in developing countries. In developed countries, uh, this is sometimes referred to as the presence of um, uh, excess smoothness of consumption in the sense that consumption, individual consumption doesn't reflect completely the shocks uh, that uh, the people uh, receive. Uh, and so uh, in many contexts, you observe that consumption is a bit smoother than, than income. So some insurance uh, happens. And so modeling um, how this happens and what kind of deviations from perfect insurance uh, makes this happen is important. And there are lots of stories about it. One uh, simple one is that um, if you write down the first simple model of perfect insurance, you assume that everybody's got the same attitude towards risk. Well, if, if that's not true, because some people are more risk averse than others, then this uh, heterogeneity in preferences can give rise to some, um, to some movements in the distribution of uh, uh, consumption that might, might not be consistent with full insurance. Um, we don't know exactly what, is the, what are the relevant uh, rig sharing uh, networks. That was a point that was raised, as I mentioned before, by Moshe and Rosenzweig, when they uh, say sometimes it's not the village, but it's more the caste to which households belong to that is relevant for rig sharing. Or there can be uh, market imperfections, and I already mentioned the presence of uh, imperfect enforceability of contracts, imperfect information 
which might be related to, to moral hazard problems. Um, recently, uh, some work, some really interesting work has, has been done on the role of networks uh, and the position that the individuals have in the network to the, to the insurance. And I'll be coming back to some of these contributions later on because we try to, to analyze the empirical implications of these uh, of these uh, models so what we do in this uh, work we look at uh, resharing uh, in a specific network and and we'll take that as a given and the network we look at is the extended family that's partly uh, data driven that's the data we have about uh, information about um, but um, but it's also natural uh, way to think about risk sharing. Families and extended families uh, are likely to be important. And if we think that information is relevant, and that's what we will be looking at, then families are a place where maybe there is a little bit more information about uh, the various members of the network than other contexts in which um, I don't know, uh, some participants don't know each other or, uh, or are completely anonymous. What we do then is we use a fairly novel empirical measure of uh, imperfect information that we uh, uh, can derive from, from the data from Tanzania that I was mentioning, and then we relate these uh, measures of uh, imperfect information to uh, the amount of resharing that we observe. Uh, and, and then we go on and we consider the role of uh, individual members in a network and consider the role of asymmetric information at the individual level. So uh, now a little bit of, of uh, theory. So we start by considering uh, a resharing group uh, as I said, this is taken as given. In the empirical application, it's going to be the extended family. Uh, and so we don't, it is an important problem, but we don't say anything about how these networks are formed. You don't choose your parents, I guess, or your siblings, but, uh, uh, but there, 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 are, there are some serious issues there. Um, and we assume that uh, individual J within this group receives an income, uh, an endowment YTJ at time T, which is made of a, com a common component Y bar T plus an idiosyncratic shock. Then individual J receives utility from consumption that does not necessarily coincide with this endowment. Why? Because they, they might receive a transfer. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we don't, uh, in the theory part, we don't consider explicitly savings, but, but they can be included easily within the model. Now, the implications of under perfect resharings, as I said, can be derived from considering a planner problem. Uh, that's what Townsend did in 1994. Um, and, um, the model allows for inequality across individuals in the sense that some individuals might be richer than others. When considering the planner problem, this is reflected in different weights that the planner gives to, to different individuals. Um, then the, re the assumption is the realization of incomes and its determinants are fully observable. Uh, by everybody in this resharing group, and the contracts can be uh, can be enforced. Under these conditions, the strong implication of perfect insurance is that the weighted marginal utility of consumption at a given point in time uh, is the same for all members in the resharing group. If that's the case. Uh, so that, that, that's what I write here. That that's the, these equations can be derived from that problem. So the lambda j here is the weight that the planner gives to individual j. That's the marginal utility consumption. This is a common discount factor, and that's the, um, the multiplier associated with um, 
the budget constraint of the economy. Now, if I take differences, I can get rid of the, of the, of the weight, uh, because it doesn't vary over time under perfect resharing. So I have an equation of this type, which, uh, as I said, is a changes in the marginal utility from two time periods are the same for all individuals. So the distribution of, uh, of, um, of this marginal utilities doesn't, doesn't change. It, it moves in parallel, so the, uh, the, the, those movements. Now, that's the way to test it. That's the, you can take this equation, uh, which holds under the theory, and to test it in practice, what I do, I add an error term, which might reflect measure, measurement errors or other unobservable uh, shifters of the marginal utility. And I add this uh, shock to resources. This is the change in income, for instance, for individual J. So what the theory does, if you run this regression for many individuals uh, in many time periods, there should be a common shock that moves everybody the same way. And these individual shocks to individual income should not enter. So the theta coefficient should be zero under perfect resharing. This is, a, in, in fact, the essence of, uh, of the Townsend approach. And what I want to stress here, which is the beauty of it, it is based on data on the shocks and on consumption, nothing else. You can be completely silent about the specific mechanisms that people use to achieve a given uh, in, in allocation of resources. And that's important in practice, because in these situations, especially in poor countries, especially for poor people, consumption can be relatively simple. But income and transfers can be extremely complex. This morning I had an interview, and I, I uh, um, told this anecdote, uh, which got stuck in, in my head for many, many years. One of the first time I went to visit a rural, this was a rural village in, um, in Mexico. And there was an interview with this lady. And she was maybe in her 60s or early 70s. And so first part of the interviewer asked all the questions about consumption, very detailed. And she knew everything. She knew how many beans and how, many, how much rice they consumed the previous week and the price of the objects and everything. And I was quite impressed because I haven't studied consumption in, uh, in developed countries where it's really hard to measure. That lady knew everything and it was clear that she knew it. Now, it's true that that's very simple consumption. It's rice and beans and, and, uh, and a few other things. So it's not very complicated. Then we move, we move to the income part. And so the guy said, the interviewer said, what's your income last month? And she said, zero. What's your husband's income? And she said, zero. What is your son's income? And she said, zero. And so the interviewer was confused and said, well, you just said that you bought this two kilos of beans last week. How could you do that if you have no income? I said, oh, yeah, that's simple. You know, my daughter uh, gave me her daughter to take care of. And because I was taking care of the little girl for a week, she gave me some money for that. And then, and what about the tomatoes that you bought? Oh, that was my cousin that uh, gave me some, whatever. So she started describing in extreme detail all these transactions. And then you realize that these people might have very simple consumption streams, but their income can be extremely complex and extremely hard to measure appropriately. And therefore, having an equation or a set of equations that can test the theory without using all that detailed information or using a very limited part of it can be extremely useful. So as I said, um, resharing is empirically rejected in, in most data sets I know. For the data set we use, there is a paper um, that actually does that. <coughs> 
And so the next challenge, I think, is to look at uh, specific imperfections that uh, cause uh, the lack of uh, risk sharing. And I mentioned already enforceability, information problems of nature, uh, various nature of moral hazard. Now I have here uh, in my slides a, a few um, papers. So these are a set of papers that look at um, imperfect enforceability uh, of contracts. I won't spend time on this. I think, uh, as you can see, I, I, I worked on this a little bit, and I think they are important uh, issues, but I won't talk about this today. Um, we will look at the information problems. I will not look at the effort. So the information that uh, imperfections that, um, that we consider is uh, I, uh, a participant to the network can hide their income. I, we are not considering situations where income might be a, a function of effort, and effort is difficult to observe, so this is the moral hazard. There are some papers that have looked at the implications of those models. Um, and some papers actually look both at imperfect enforceability and imperfect information, moral hazard. Uh, and these are cited here. Uh, it, it is hard to put, in theory, the two things together. So here is simple um, in, in perfect information, um, and we try to derive empirical implications of that. We consider a static framework and refrain from uh, going to the um, incentive compatibility constraints and truth-telling constraints. Um, so. I, I still have an individual receiving an endowment, which is why I uh, JT, uh, except that this endowment now is made of, uh, is not observable. What people in the network observe is this XJT. And actually have, this is what individual K um, observes. So I let people in the, in the, um, a network to have differential access to information. Some guys can be very informed about their cousin's uh, income. Other guys who maybe live far away don't know much about it. So I like this, uh, this possibility. Um, in situation of this kind, we can consider, uh, for simplicity, we start with the two members um, uh, resharing group, so individual one and two. And, um, and so we have uh, just two sources of noise. Um, and so effectively what we are saying is that the contracts that can be written among these individuals can be written on the basis of what can be observed, which is, uh, which is the X's, not the Y's. Uh, so under perfect resharing, when there is perfect information, uh, suppose that uh, they have the same preferences. And that, you know, you can you can make that a little bit more sophisticated. But suppose that they have uh, the same preferences uh, of a certain type. Uh, you give them the same weights, maybe because their income um, means are the same. Then perfect resharing is that they just split their income. And you know, if they're risk averse, that's convenient. Uh, there's less fluctuations, only the aggregate. So the transfer between one and the two is the transfer ma makes their consumption the same. So that's pretty simple. Under imperfect information, if you write the contrast on the basis of the x's rather than the y's, then, then this is a little bit different. So that's what, uh, the transfer is going to be similar, but based on the x's rather than the y. Um, there are some restrictions here to obtain the result, but you can show that the, the restricted optimal is this form. And this is not first best. It's not the optimal. Um, so in fact, here I write the difference between the optimal allocation and, uh, and the achievable allocation. And you can see this is a function of these uh, noises. And the larger is the variance of these noises, the, the farther away you are from, 
uh, first pass. If these are zero all the time, so they have a, a zero variance, then you achieve first pass. So that's what I was saying. <clears throat> Now, one possible approach, therefore, is to try to derive a measure of the intensity of this um, asymmetric information. And then, uh, once you quantify that, you can relate the, um, the, um, uh, the resharing that you observe in groups uh, to, to this. If you remember the Townsend equation, there was this equation where we introduced this additional variable, which is uh, the effect that the idiosyncratic shocks have on idiosyncratic uh, consumption. And now you can change it and you can let the effect of these idiosyncratic shocks to be a function of the level of asymmetry of information. Okay? Now the trick is going to be to construct measures of this asymmetry. So the, treat the, uh, the treatment of asymmetric information is complex, uh, partly because it's rarely you have data uh, about this. Um, one of the advantages of perfect regime model, because it still can be used as a benchmark, and therefore if you manage to get the information on the degree of asymmetric information, you can relate that to how far away you are from first base without, again, being specific about the transfers that people um, uh, 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 face. Let me, <clears throat> now, one possible um, theoretical approach is to assume that the resharing is implemented by bilateral transfers that uh, can be contractable on the basis of the information available to the two members. And that's indeed is one of the results that uh, I'll come back to by um, Ambrose et al. in their paper. In such a situation, one can construct asymmetric information at the individual level, and then can think of uh, relating that level to the vulnerability to shocks, or can think of averaging this um, individual asymmetry and then consider the resharing um, uh, at, um, at, uh, uh, at the level of the network. Now, as I mentioned, this is similar to the uh, recent work that Ambrose, Gao, and Milan have, and uh, that's been applied empirically by Milan and, and others, who some data from Bolivia. Um, however, in what we do, as we'll see, there are some, some differences. Um, how am I doing with time? So let me skip this uh, further theory because I would like to spend some time, because this refers a lot to this uh, um, Ambrose et al. work. Uh, Maybe when I do show the empirical, I'll come back to that. But now I want to move to the empirical part. So the data we use are come from Tanzania, uh, and in particular from a region in Tanzania. The first survey was collected in Kagera, in the Kagera region, um, which is relatively isolated and from, far from, from the capital, um, where agriculture remains the main source of income. Um, the study started in 91, 94, there were four rounds, and then there was a wave in 2004 and a wave in 2010, which are the main data we'll be using. The data is very rich and of high quality, it contains information on demographics, on consumption, on income, including transfers and on wealth. Um, as we'll see, it has got reciprocal information on wealth indicators. So if Sonia and I are on the same network, they ask me about Sonia's wealth, and they ask Sonia's about my wealth. And then they ask me about my wealth and her about uh, her wealth. Um, there's a very low attrition uh, over, uh, uh, over the long time period to consider, 
which makes the data particularly attractive. These are our three maps that show you where the original 91, 94 data were in, in, in this uh, region here. Each, each dot is a, is a household. That's where they were in uh, 2004, and that's where they were in uh, uh, 2010. And the beauty of this survey is that uh, if you go back to uh, 91, so each, each household is a little dot. And then they spread out because uh, some of them move out. And, and the data maintain contact with the extended family. So each green dot might belong to one of the um, purple dots in the first graph. And then you keep following them in 2010. So you can construct this data on, on these networks and you know where they live and keep collecting all the relevant information. So this is to give you an idea. So there were 915 households in the first few rounds um, and therefore 915 extended households. Um, now there are 2,774 uh, households in four belonging on 831 extended households. Then the, the, you drop some. Uh, this is the number of households per extended households and the mean distance uh, between uh, the members of the networks. So the, this gives you an idea. And that's where they go. Um, you know, s s some, they split, but they live in the same cluster as uh, 10 years ago, and it's only 50% of them. And then they move er elsewhere in a, a nearby village, elsewhere, 10% uh, elsewhere in Tanzania, 2% in a neighboring country. So there is a, quite a bit of variation here. Um, and this is how the sample changes. And not surprisingly, the uh, average age of the household ed becomes uh, smaller because you f there are new households formed um, and, and therefore there are new uh, household heads that are younger. Um, the year schooling change is a new cohort coming along uh, and uh, the highest of, uh, level of education. Household size, uh, it's a bit smaller, again, not surprisingly, given that you're splitting these uh, households. Uh, there was an, uh, some averages um, land owned. Uh, what is impressive is uh, there are big changes here. These are, these are 2010 prices. Uh, consumption per capita does increase quite, quite a bit. So there is lots of things going on uh, over, over this period. These are terms that we use. Uh, uh, the previous household members are effectively all the household members from the original 91-94 households. Uh, and the extended household are all the uh, PHHM who were living in the same household in the original data collection. And the network uh, is a measurement of interactions between, between all these members. Now, shocks are very important, are going to be very important for us. We don't rely, or we haven't relied so far on information about income, as in the Townsend equation that I showed you before, but we rely, what we think is a bit more, uh, uh, more credible information on, the, on shocks. Uh, so households are asked to, re, to report uh, the uh, occurrence of shocks, um, the household head, and there could be a good shock, a very good shock on an average a bad or very bad year. Um, the, the, the top three reasons for very bad year is the death of family members, the poor harvest, and serious illness. And those are uh, for, uh, corresponding for the very good years. Uh, and that's the prevalence of, uh, of different show. And so you can see that, you know, um, there are lots of very bad shocks and, uh, and lots of them are uh, related to agriculture uh, failures. There's a table that says, well, they are asked uh, what they do to cope for, with these shocks. And you can see that quite a few of them 
relies, that's the most common cause, relies on, on family and friends from networks. Um, uh, some reduce consumption, so there's no perfect insurance. Oh, you cannot say that because it could be that these shocks are, could be common to, to everybody. But um, they sell assets, they work more or differently, but quite a few rely on, uh, on family and friends. Uh, we have information on transfers in 2010. Uh, the, uh, they collect some information on, on the transfers and uh, each household in the extended family it was also asked about giving and receiving help for, uh, at specific times and those are the, the reasons why these transfers are, are made. And we have data on, in, on these interactions, therefore. So if we want to use the Townsend approach to measure the presence of perfect sharing since data, that's the sort of regression we like. Uh, we run. That's the change on, on log consumption, and we regress it on uh, good shock and bad shocks. Um, and so under perfect resharing, given that we have an household, an uh, extended household fixed effect, which reflects the common shocks, then those two coefficients should be zero if they diversify risk. And that's what, um, that's what we get. That's within the village, that's within the extended uh, network, and, and you reject the hypothesis that, uh, that they are zero, especially for the bad shocks. That's not a surprise. As I said, there was already a paper that has been published on this data that shows these results. Uh, that's the, the probability uh, that the transfer um, is related to shocks. And you can see that the presence of bad shocks increases the probability of receiving a, a transfer uh, and reduces the probability, although not very significantly, of uh, giving a, a transfer. So now to the main part of the, of the paper, well, the main, one of the most interesting part, in my opinion, which is the construction of me the measures um, about asymmetric in information. So each household is asked that lots of questions about all these items, if, whether they own them or not. And then the same questions are asked about members or other members of the extended household. So does he own house, does he own land, does he own, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what we can do is to compare what I say about my wealth to what Sonia says about my wealth and vice versa. So the way we do it, uh, first, uh, we want to, um, let me go there. First, we want to um, construct an index of wealth. So we run an item response, a factor model of uh, wealth on these indicators. And so that gives an efficient way to use all the information on, on, the, on the wealth indicators that we have. Uh, once we estimate the, this model, we have a distribution, um, we have an estimate of the theta, which is the, this wealth factor. How rich, given the, the, we know this guy owns an ox and uh, owns some land that doesn't own a telephone, etc. our estimate of the wealth is, uh, is a number. And we can estimate this function that relates the indicators to this wealth. Now, the next step is to take these estimates and apply the same function to the reports of the other guys. So then I get uh, a summary of what Sonia thinks about my wealth. If I plug into this function that I estimated on, on my data uh, to, um, to get an estimate of uh, her perception of my wealth. Okay, so 
so we can have a true model that relates the indicators to the, and then an estimated model, which for individual K gives me an estimated of the wealth factor for individual J. Okay? So this is this distribution of wealth that you get from the true model, from the true data. And the red one is the distribution of the estimated data. So there, is, there are some differences. Um, and, and now we can use these uh, indicators to construct our measures of uh, asymmetric information. In particular, we take as alpha k i h j as the asymmetry of information between household k and j in, um, in extended household h as the absolute value of the estimates of, uh, of the true estimate and, and the estimate as reported by the, the individual. Notice that this, uh, these measures can be asymmetric. So they might be, so I might know a lot about Sonia, but she might know very little about me. And so that will be reflected in, the, in, in, this, um, in this thing. And then we can average this, uh, this estimate in, uh, in each network. And so we get a, a, a measure at the network level. Notice we can use them both. We can use this and we can use that, as we'll see. Uh, and notice that uh, this measure here depends on the size of the network. And so uh, probably a better measure is the, uh, taking the average, so dividing by the uh, network size, uh, so to make it um, not depending on that. <coughs> How do they look like? <clears throat> There's the distribution of the individual. These are the alphas. How we have 14,000 pairs of individuals. Um, and you can see that um, as, she, as they live in different places, the information deteriorates. So a, a small alpha means that they, they know they have very good information. As you move away, uh, this becomes bigger and bigger, uh, and individuals that live far away are, are, are more subject to this uh, symmetry uh, of information. Um, and this is um, uh, by distance quintile, the same thing. The farther, uh, so this is where they live, and this is uh, using the, the distance. And you can see that uh, as you go down the distribution, you get, you get bigger, as, as is reasonable. It's also related by how frequent they talk to each other. And so for people that talk uh, quite frequently, it's relatively small. For people that haven't been talking a lot, they don't know much about each other. So now uh, we can consider, um, as I said, we can do it um, by pairs or, or aggregated. The pairs are interesting because we can construct all, for each network we have a matrix which relates to all the individuals in the network. And uh, we can construct these uh, agency matrices and from them we can construct the properties of networks. Typically in, um, in network analysis, at least the one I, I know, I, I read, uh, these agency matrix are zero, one. So either you have a connection or you don't. Um, but here we can do a little bit better because for each pair, it's not necessarily zero, one. It, it can be, um, it can be um, high quality or low quality. But still you can use the same sort of uh, a technology to construct this uh, the JCC matrices, and from those you can construct uh, measures of the position of uh, of an individual in a network. Um, so that's the, that's what we do. We can construct different ma uh, matrices. One in which uh, we consider explicitly the asymmetry, the possibility of asymmetry. One we say, okay, we don't believe that and we average between the, the symmetric pairs, so we call force the symmetry on the, on the matrix. Um, 
So the A seems to be responsive to uh, the transfers responsive to shocks. Now we want to relate our measure of asymmetric information to the amount of risk sharing. So we know that, uh, that uh, consumption, you reject perfect risk sharing because consumption uh, reacts to, to individual shocks. How much do they uh, react uh, given the quality of information, and also how much do they react in relationship to the position in the network, the centrality, and that refers to some of the results in Ambrose et al. So let's, uh, let's the old, I already show you these numbers. This is, the, this is the Townsend equation, if you wish, where uh, a negative shock causes, uh, even after controlling for the fixed effect, uh, causes um, um, a negative effect on, on, on the low consumption of an individual. So that's the rejection of, uh, of a negative shock, and a positive shock uh, as a positive effect. So idiosyncratic shocks are not diversified away, which you, we already seen this number. Now what I do, I add to these uh, measures the um, um, the, the, average, the quality of the information uh, in, in, um, in the network, and I interact that with, uh, um, with the shock. And you can see that, uh, take a, an individual who gets a negative shock. This coefficient disappears. It becomes from positive to zero, effectively. Um, if AI is large, it means that this is a network of, with, um, um, with um, um, lots of asymmetric information. And therefore, for those guys, the shock is relevant. But if you are in a network with uh, zero, where AI is close to zero, effectively, uh, that network is able to diversify negative shocks. And analogously for this one, effectively the sum of those coefficients is very close to zero. So this is an indication that this measure of asymmetric information seems to be related to the vulnerability of uh, uh, network members to negative, uh, negative and positive shocks. And for, for networks where this is close to zero, you, you get close to first best. That's what I was saying. I haven't said anything about transfer here. I'm still relying exclusively on the, on the um, allocations of, on consumption and shocks. Uh, and, but yet this measure uh, tells me that when I work with networks with good information, you're pretty close to first best. That's why it's so useful to still keep the Townsend structure as, as, a, as a benchmark. Now, here I move to do it uh, with the individual data. And so now it's not the average, but it's the, it's the, um, it, it, it's the average at the individual level. And still you get a very similar result. If you put the two of them together, then, then uh, the action seems to be coming more from the individual data. Which again is interesting because it says that this asymmetric information at the, determines the, the asymmetrical information at the individual level is, is what determines the vulnerability to shocks. Uh, that is eventually reflected on a, uh, on a bad, quality, bad um, information network but, but most of the action seems to come from at the individual level. So uh, here we move a step forward and we try to look at uh, uh, risk sharing and uh, network centrality. These tables are going to be a little bit um, difficult to interpret, but I have for only four minutes. So let me tell you the general idea that was taken from the Ambrose et al. paper. In that paper, uh, what they show is that um, the, um, 
position of an individual within a network determines the, the vulnerability. And in particular, they focus on various measures of network centrality. So an individual which is central to the network, so is the node to where with lots of different connections, uh, they actually perform, they are more vulnerable. Why is that? Intuitively, they obtain the results with some assumptions, but the intuition is that an individual of this type has to provide insurance to lots of guys, and they don't, and so he ends up being in a bad place. Um, what we do here, we can construct these measures of network uh, centrality in a way which is both related to what they do I, with zero one. We simply classify um, um, an, a connection between two visual to, to be zero if um, asymmetric information is bad enough or is one if uh, there is little of it. And I think we choose the median. So whether it's above or below the median to, to be zero one. Or we can do a more complicated um, measures where uh, we let this network centrality to be determined by, not only by the presence of connections, but the quality of these connections, okay? So here are the results. Again, this is the old one where you reject resharing. Now here what we do is the bus shock uh, with, uh, we take the average eigenvalue centrality um, uh, and then we do it at the individual level. Um, and this is the zero one. Um, so it's not particularly significant when you do the individual level. However, when we uh, use the weighted, I, we let these um, this, uh, this, um, connections to be of different quality, not necessarily zero or one, then you find that even at the individual level, this plays a fairly important role in the vulnerability of individuals to shock. And again, good connections uh, make, um, a good quality makes for better resharing. Now, this results is a, the opposite of what they have in theory, in the sense that now, if I'm in a uh, high um, network centrality, I actually perform quite well. Uh, and so, the next step in this research agenda is to try to uh, think of modification of that models uh, to, uh, to implement this thing. And this is uh, uh, now a forcing symmetry, you get, you get similar, uh, similar effects. So to conclude, so what we've done in this paper is to um, uh, analyze the relationship between resharing and asymmetric information. And we have effectively two, two approaches. The first one that tries to construct an overall measures of, a, of um, asymmetric information and then relate it to the vulnerability to shocks. And we find that uh, bad information is bad for resharing. And then we also consider the, um, uh, something about uh, the, the role of the position of individuals in the network. And we find that people that are more central are, seems to be less vulnerable to um, idiosyncratic shocks. And I'll stop here. Okay, thank you, Arezzo, um, for a fantastic talk. Uh, lots of interesting results there. Um, we're now open to, to discussion from the floor. And so um, anybody has a question, you can just raise your hand and then I'll, I'll let Arezzo you choose your own questions. I think there's um, One thing I want to yeah. say is that uh, feel free to ask questions in Spanish. <laughs> Don, I'm going to have to use the translation. <laughs> All right, so I'll let, I'll let you, you... Oh, I should, Nathan is first. <laughs> Sorry. So you have this, you had this nice picture when the, you know, families start in the same place and then they spread. I mean, given your results, I mean, 
families have some benefits stay close because then there is insurance, but then, of course, there are also economic opportunities. Do you have any sense how these location decisions were cho made by these households? How do they trade off, you know, diversification versus staying close uh, with the parents, uh, with the original uh, family members? That's a very good question. It's something that we've been uh, thinking about. We haven't done much work on it, but uh, it's obvious that uh, the, the motiva most of the formation of these families is for migrations, and uh, the presence of uh, imperfect information is driven by migration and migration to further away places. And uh, you might argue that um, the level of information um, might be related to economic opportunities and therefore uh, to um, the, uh, the choice, you know, the, the, the type of networks might be related uh, not just to asymmetric information but the economic opportunity, which is true. And we have been thinking about ways to um, try to model explicitly the decision to migrate maybe in relation to weather and that's something we're investigating. Having said that, uh, I should also point out that we are working first differences in a way. So we take consumption between 10 and 14, and we take um, the, change, the shocks, as the shocks that uh, happened just before 10. The structure is given at, at 2010. So, so um, given we are doing first differences, we might be okay in that respect. Um, Another question is whether these people who move far away and then they kind of, uh, you know, they are less connected to the extended family, may, maybe they replace uh, insurance with some other networks, you know, friends, etc. So that you don't, can you observe that? Yeah, that, that, that's another very good question. The, obviously, here we're talking about the amount of resharing that happens within the network. It could well be that once you move to the town, you get access to other ways to diversify your risk, and, and we cannot say anything about that. Um, so, so my first question was kind of related to the previous one, was about, you know, uh, because the variation that you use in order to, well, to, to, to obtain variation in information is in a good chunk is the instance, so how much then we can uh, separate the effect, you know, distance from the effect of, uh, of, of, of information, right? So uh, an extended family that is very much spread out on Tanzanian uh, um, territory might be not so much connected anymore. And so that might be one reason why we observe uh, smaller. And I think perhaps it could be possible to interact the, uh, the shock with the distance so the moment you're interacting the shock with the um, information, and then interacting also the shock with distance, then and see once you do that, how much is, uh, is kind of left. I don't know if that kind of makes sense. And then the second question, which is kind of broader, uh, at, the, at the very beginning, you mentioned Townsend and kind of the, um, the idea that at the household level, uh, shocks, even though are derived from, from a common shock that can be rainfall, they actually end up being idiosyncratic because of many reasons. So you have this very nice direct uh, self-reported uh, measure of shock. Would it be possible to use that to uh, have an estimate of how much of the shocks are common uh, within village and how much is it are idiosyncratic and, and how the extended okay. network in terms of distance uh, acts into that? Okay. Uh, the first question is, uh, again, uh, you're right. I mean, uh, it is true that uh, information, um, information and the quality of information is related to distance. And we, we, we show that. Uh, I'm reasonably happy with, uh, I, you're probably right, but I don't think that affects my results about the relevance of information for resharing because of this uh, uh, sequencing of, of things. Even if people choose that, unless you think that, uh, if you think of the original Townsend equation, if you think that um, for some level, the level of, the level of uh, information asymmetry in 2010 
are related to possible changes in unobservable needs, uh, then my, which, by the way, is a problem with, um, with the Townsend test anyway. But uh, then, then it could be that the, the, the test we are doing uh, heals the biased results. But if you're willing to buy that, then, now I would say that you're absolutely right. It would be interesting per se to, mod to model the evolution of uh, asymmetric information and its determinants and the like and related to the choice. But in terms of uh, how robust the results are on the vulnerability, I, I, I feel pretty comfortable. comfortable. Uh, the second question was which? The second question was about the relationship. So if you can somehow um, have a sense into the slurring network of shots. Uh, oh, yeah. Which is a common versus how much yeah. is it in Yeah, we, we can do that. In a way, in the regressions, it's taken care of because, uh, because uh, you get the fist effect for, for the time and, uh, and uh, extended family. Those are all there. So it's in the regressions, uh, in the test, it's taken care of. But having said that, it is interesting, and it would be nice to decompose the variability of shocks into what is common and what is idiosyncratic, and we could do that. Thanks. Um, that was very interesting. I was thinking that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the degree of care of some dynasties against others. Some dynasties care a lot about each other and invest in finding how, how the others are doing, whether other, whether other dynasties do not care as much and they keep low level of information and uh, do not insure each other. So I was thinking how uh, if we can interpret this as heterogeneity in the degree of altruism without a dynasty, within a dynasty, a dynasty or versus uh, information. Yeah, I think in general, I mean, as I said, this, for us, uh, I don't know if other people have done that, but this uh, constructive dispensation was pretty new, and uh, the way we done it is, uh, we didn't know how to do this, and uh, having done this and uh, having related to resharing, the next step is to try to understand better how changes across families, and you're absolutely right, it would be interesting. Distance is the obvious one, but there are many other, uh, what are the, who, which one are the, apart from those living far away, which are the families with better information, what's the education level? And then the same sort of comments applies also to these measures of network centrality. Uh, what, what, you know, who are the guys that are central in the network? Who are the guys playing a big role? And I think all those are <clears throat> interesting questions. But it's not something we've done so far. So, Aretha, can I exploit my position just to ask a question? So, uh, the, one of the tables that you showed us was about coping strategies, which I thought was, was a, an incredible set of numbers. So, there you saw about 70% of households reported going to the family, sorry, 25%. 30%, yeah. So it got me thinking about sort of what determines which coping strategy you use. So in some cases you saw that households were saying they respond in terms of their own labor supply. And naturally I would think of that as if it's a sufficiently small shock, I can just make some adjustments myself. Then perhaps if it's a very large shock, then we're into the extreme case where I have to sell off assets, and that's the case that I've often worried about. In the, you're basically damaging yourself in the long run. So just going forward as a research agenda, I mean, what, what would you say is we know about when households use these different coping strategies? Here we focus on that 25% when you go to your family. But if a shock is too large, presumably the family can't ensure that. And if it's too small, you don't need the family to do that. So do you think asymmetric information plays a role in whether you ask your family in the first that place? That could the be. Boundaries? That's something that we have not looked at. This is a very new table that we produced a few days ago. Uh, but but it's, it's definitely interesting. And uh, one, one interesting question to ask those data is, um, so who are the guys that use the family? Are the, how, the, how does that depend on the size of the shock, but also how does that depend on the quality of uh, information? 
So uh, our families, uh, um, where information is good, those that are mostly used for, for dealing with shocks. Um, and that's something that we can, we can answer those questions. Right, are there uh, any questions? All right, great. I think we've got lots of food for thought for, with all of those uh, results and great, fascinating new data. Um, so I look forward to seeing the, the article come out in print in the NGIA sometime next year. Um, so uh, let's all thank Horatio again for a fantastic uh, lecture.